Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for coming tonight. Uh, my name is Nicholas Manusis. I am the Executive Director of the Horological Society of New York, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here to our November 2022 meeting. As usual, we'll get started with a few announcements. So a quick education update. We have, uh, of course, our New York classes going on in the evenings and on the weekends throughout the month of November. And we also will be traveling. We're going to be traveling to Los Angeles on November 19th, hosted by our friends at FP Jorn. Uh, Seattle, December 10th and 11th, hosted by Grand Seiko and Benbridge Jeweler. And then also heading to Hawaii, the first time in Hawaii, uh, January 13th and 14th, also hosted by Grand Seiko and Benbridge Jeweler. Uh, so if you are here in New York, you're welcome to come and take our classes up upstairs here on the fifth floor. And if you have any friends or family in the cities that I just mentioned, encourage them to, uh, to take a look at their classes and we'll be coming their way very soon. And some, some new membership benefits. I announced this at the October meeting, and you may have seen some, uh, some press about it, some articles, some publicity about it, but I thought it bared mentioning again. Uh, HSNY is expanding its membership benefits and introducing new membership levels. And the new membership benefits are in collaboration with the Armory, a, a famous menswear shop uh, that has locations here in New York and in Hong Kong. A really fabulous clothing and what they've done they've designed a special members only jacket for the horological society of new york also a uh, special members only tote so the gold level membership gets you access to that jacket it, it's actually it's not access it gets you that jacket for free it's part of being a member uh, and also the silver uh, level membership gets you access gets you that the tote for free so Consider uh, signing up uh, for one of these new membership levels. Consider upgrading your membership. Uh, all of the, uh, the funds that we raise from these new membership levels are reinvested right back into education. Uh, they're given out in the form of scholarships uh, at our annual gala. So thank you, uh, especially to our friends at the Armory for, for making this happen. It's, it's really, uh, really pretty exciting to, to see. And then also speaking of membership benefits, uh, we are now uh, uh, including in our magazine roster, Revolution Magazine. So all HSNY members now get access to a Revolution Magazine subscription, uh, in addition to the uh, I think four or five other magazines that we're offering as well. So plenty of material for your, uh, your coffee table, plenty of, uh, of magazines to peruse. All right, so this is, this is an announcement that I'm really excited to make. It's something that we've been working on in the background for three years now. It was kind of our, uh, our secret COVID project, you could, you could call it that. So since 1866, when the Horological Society of New York was founded, we've had a library. It was one of the uh, very early initiatives of the organization. And we've always operated this library as a membership, you know, membership benefit. It's a, a resource for our members to come if they are looking uh, to do uh, some specific research, they have some questions that, that uh, they can't find answers for anywhere else. Uh, the library was a place for them. And what we've done recently is really massively expand our library. Uh, it's now uh, one of the largest horological libraries in the world. We have over 25,000 titles that are um, specialized horological titles. Uh, really almost anything you're looking for uh, from a horological perspective uh, in literature can be found uh, at the HSNY Yost Berge Research Library. And the kind of the, the, the fun part about all of this, that library is, is here in this building, but up on the fifth floor. So I encourage you all to come back uh, anytime during the week, take a look at the library. Uh, it's a 2,000 square foot space. It overlooks the Harvard Club. It's a beautiful space. And this is a photo from our grand opening, which we just had uh, a couple weeks ago. We had two representatives from the Joost Berge Society in Switzerland come and unveil the, the name of, of the library. Uh, and it's just, it's a, it's a special place. You know, it's a, it's a it's a place where you can come to, uh, to learn, to, to, to read, to, 
to find out new things. And it's also a place where, in a way, time kind of stands still. So I encourage you all to come and take a look at the library upstairs. Uh, during the week, it's open Monday through Friday uh, from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. Uh, our, our wonderful librarian, uh, Dr. Miranda Maricini in the back there, uh, she will greet you at the library. She's waving to all of us if you want, if you want to look and say hi. Thank you, Miranda. Yeah, uh, yeah so, so come, come and check it out. And you're going to see lots more publicity, lots more um, uh, articles about the library this month. We're just opening it up to the public. So lots of fun. Okay, so on to tonight's main event. Tonight, we're talking about an icon, uh, an icon of modern horology. I think it, it goes beyond that. I think that the watch that we're talking about tonight, in some ways, has defined modern horology through its use of new materials, uh, innovative uh, manufacturing techniques. There's just so much to talk about with this watch. And the watch that I'm referring to, of course, is the Freak, uh, the Freak by Ulysse Nardon. So tonight we're, we're joined by, uh, by someone who knows the Freak uh, from every possible perspective. Uh, he's the Chief Product Officer at Ulysse Nordan, and he's visiting us tonight. He traveled to, to visit us from Lillac in Switzerland. Please join me in welcoming Jean-Christophe Sabatier. Hello, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure and a privilege for me to share this moment with you tonight. Uh, as Nicolas said, uh, I am in charge of product at Ulysse Nardin, meaning uh, at, in my team I have the product development, the product marketing, and the design. And I am working for this uh, marvelous brand since a um, little bit more than six years now. Very quickly, I've been uh, passionate by the freak and the history of this product, and I would like to share with you what I learned from all the people I met at the manufacturer and all the people who have built the history of that brand. In a certain manner, I have chosen to start by the conclusion for this lecture. Uh, why do I believe that the freak deserves a lecture at HMSY tonight? I will see two reasons. Uh, the first one is that, on a brand perspective, it has really been a uh, holy grail for us. Uh, the freak has allowed the company to establish itself as an independent integrated manufacturer, and I will come back on that in detail. And the second reason is that I believe that, uh, and I know that I'm not the only one to believe in that, <laughs> the Freak uh, should be considered as the first hyperwatch uh, of the industry. This product has opened the door to another way to conceive watchmaking and to interpret uh, not in a traditional manner, if I may say, uh, this uh, incredible art of watchmaking. Maybe before we enter into the specific topic of tonight, a few words of background related to the brand. Uh, as you may know, Ulysse Nardin has been establishing itself as a company in 1846 founded by a watchmaker, Mr. Elis Nardin. Uh, we have been developing a lot of uh, complications, shining pieces, uh, chronometer, uh, pocket watches, of course. And quickly, we have been uh, specializing ourselves in producing navigation instruments that were absolutely key in, let's say, the the overall navigation, the, the long haul navigation, the conquest uh, of the ocean, and particularly uh, on a military standpoint. We have been the very first company uh, 
qualitatively speaking and quantitatively speaking to deliver with navigation instruments at the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century. And maybe something that uh, you should know is that at that period of time, uh, we have already been a manufacturer producing its own calibers and also uh, some escapements, particularly with the partnership we have established with uh, Mr. Neal, who was a Physics Nobel Prize uh, at that time. And uh, I had the chance to do a, a specific lecture uh, on that topic, chronometry, uh, uh, a little bit more than two years ago. Uh, and here you really find the origins, the roots of the brand. So a technical brand with navigation instruments. The brand has almost died uh, as a company during the quartz crisis period. And uh, an incredible entrepreneur, very energetic, uh, called Mr. Rolf Schneider, decided to buy that brand uh, in uh, 1983. At that time, only two persons were still working inside the company. So uh, it, was, it was disappearing, if I may say. And uh, Rolf has entirely relaunched that brand. He has decided to do that through the most difficult uh, uh, way, the technical way. Uh, through very specific product launches, very daring complications uh, based on uh, astronomy, chaining pieces, uh, perpetual calendars, particularly through a very prolific partnership uh, with uh, a genius, Mr. Ludwig Oshin, and we are going to come back on that, of course. Rolf was uh, passionate by the content and he has decided constantly to improve the content of the products that were produced by Ulysse Nardin and uh, very quickly, as he was really striving for independence as an entrepreneur, he has decided to reinvest all the benefits into the establishment of the integrative manufacturer that is Ulysse Nardin today again. And the, the, the history of the fruit is very intertwined with this journey. Let's talk a little bit about the origins of the concept. Four persons have participated uh, in this uh, incredible uh, history or story uh, related to this concept. Carol Forest et Calsapi, Ludwig Gauchelin, Pierre Gigax, and Rolf Schinder himself. So, let's enter more in detail into this saga. Uh, what you see on the screen is the very first freak. And let's go to the very first idea that uh, brought us to the product that you have just seen. The story began in 1997 uh, with a person that is in the middle of this picture. She is uh, 25 years old. She's a woman. She's the only woman. She's the youngest, probably, in this assembly. And she won the Brigade Prize. Uh, she was competing with very famous watchmakers, Daniels, Loiseau, Jour were present for that prize. And she won. She was a girl, <laughs> which, uh, as you can imagine, was uh, quite a revolution. And she has presented this concept. Uh, the, the principle is that she really, she really wanted to change the mindset in the way the calibers were uh, conceived 
not in a traditional way. Uh, she, was, she wanted to do something that would be orbital. And uh, she has created uh, a concept that, uh, uh, where you can see here on the drawing that you see on the left side of the screen, the, the mainstream is around the, the caliber. So the idea was to make the watch quite thin. And you had the possibility to set the watch through the bezel. This was really, the, let's say, the, the one of the technical uh, element of interest with the fact that it was also uh, 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 an orbital caliber. You see the very first prototype that has been built uh, with Ulysse Nardin. Carol Forcy Kachapi was working at Ulysse Nardin at that time. And so she, she, Ulysse Nardin helped us to build this prototype and uh, to start the project at won that price. She spent uh, nearly four years inside the company and she left. And she has a, a strong legacy in the watchmaking industry with orbital calibers, particularly in the Richmond Group, and particularly uh, inside uh, uh, a famous brand, Cartier. A relative weakness of this concept was the fact that as the, the, the uh, mainstream was around the caliber, uh, the power reserve was not, uh, was not uh, sufficient enough. Uh, it was uh, something around, uh, let's say, uh, 15 hours. So it was, it was the weakness of this concept. And um, Mr. Pierre Gigax, who was, who was the head, uh, the technical head of the manufacturer, asked Ludwig Gauchelin to contribute and bring also his know-how into this project. This uh, 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 brought us to a real breakthrough because the idea from uh, Ludwig has been to modify two main uh, elements, if I may say. The first one is that he has decided to put the mainstream below the caliber. Uh, so, of course, obviously, the concept was a little bit more thick. Uh, but as a result, uh, with, a, with a very specific uh, mainstream of two meter lengths, it has been possible to propel, if I may say, uh, a revolutionary flying carousel because through the calculation Ludwig came to the conclusion that uh, if you are orbital and if you um, adjust uh, a little bit uh, the way the product is built, you are able to use in fact the movement itself in order to tell the time. So you, you see on the left side of the screen the very first prototype of the freak that has been produced by Ludwig. And as you can see, uh, you, have, you have here a bridge uh, that is uh, carrying the, the gear train that is indicated, indicating the minutes. Uh, so in fact, uh, the idea here is that the movement is telling the time. And at, as a result, uh, you come to the idea that you have a product with no hands, you keep the original idea from Carol with a product with no crown because you set the time through the bezel. And in addition to that, you indicate the hours uh, directly from the movement, so as a consequence you, are, you have no dial. So no dial, no crown, no hands. So you have, of course, here on the right side of the screen, the screen a photo of Ludwig Gauchelin in front of a photo of Mr. Rolf Schneider. <coughs> so the main breakthrough, uh, in my opinion, from Ludwig has been this idea to use the rotation of the movement in order to tell the time. It's not only, I mean, for me, it's a philosophic way to interpret uh, timekeeping. And at that time, I think it's very important for us because today we see the, the concept as it is in the 21st century. 
we, see, we see so many incredible things in the market in terms of technical uh, creativity uh, that uh, at the end you are, I mean we are less and less surprised, but if you, if you consider this idea uh, for that period of time, it was after the quartz crisis period and uh, all the brands were reinventing themselves, but on a, let's say, traditional way. And they were recovering, let's say, the nose that has been lost during the quartz crisis. But here the idea has been uh, to, to do a tabula rasa, as, you, as we, we can say, and reinterpret entirely what could be uh, the principle, uh, the, the, the concept of what we can. So that's it, no dial, no hands, no crown, and the movement is key. But freak is not only uh, breakthrough in terms of concept and construction. Uh, it's not only uh, a free dimensional interpretation of a timepiece. It is also a technical revolution for what is inside the movement. Uh, Pierre Vigax, that you can see here on the right side of the screen, was the head of the manufacturer. And he was working in order to, uh, to make happen the vision of Rolf Schneider to establish Ulysse Nardin as an independent company. Independency was uh, uh, directly linked to uh, the portfolio of calibers that should be developed by the brand, but not only, it was also related to the escapement and the, the regulation organs. At that time, as you know, the market was, if I may say, uh, quite closed, uh, quite monopolistic. And the idea was to uh, launch some new material and new technologies through the freak in order to reach this level of independence. So uh, this brought us to the silicium technology. We are going to come back on it. And you see on the left uh, part of the screen a photo of Cigatech. Cigatech uh, is a uh, a company that is a joint venture owned 50% uh, by Ulysses Nardin, 50% by Mimotech. Uh, Mimotech is a uh, quite well known supplier that is specialized in the Liga process and working on uh, nickel uh, um, components for watches. And Ulysses Nardin and Mimotech have joined their know-how and efforts in order to make uh, this uh, revolution of the silicium escapement happen on the market. So Pierre Gigax has not only conceived, developed this idea of new materials for the escapement, but he has also developed the means to produce them because it was the only manner for us to be independent. And again, I would like to relate that to that period of time. I mean, Ulysses Nardin has jumped from uh, two uh, employees' company uh, in 1985 uh, to a company that would launch a new revolutionary escapement in 2001. So you can imagine the level of energy and, uh, let's say, uh, uh, courage, if I may say, that was necessary to do that in front of uh, big giants that were uh, heavily investing in R&D uh, already in the watchmaking industry. The dual direct escapement and the dual Ulysse escapement have been two patented silicium escapements that have been launched for the very first time inside the freak. And we are going to, uh, of course, see that a little bit more in detail. The last person, of course, that brought a decisive uh, impulsion uh, was Mr. Rolf Schneider himself. I, call, I, I decided to call him the prophet because I really believe that you need to carry a vision, a, pro a project that is huge uh, in your mind if you want to bring uh, a small company to such level of uh, achievement uh, in such limited time. Uh, Rolf 
Ralph Schneider, in my opinion, uh, is a freaky guy. I cannot explain his personality in another way. Uh, you have uh, on the left a photo uh, the, the, the person who is wearing the mask uh, on the very uh, left side of the, of the picture is Mr. Rolf Schneider himself. You are at the Basel Fair in 2001 and Rolf is presenting the very first freak to the public. Rolf was originally coming from Basel and uh, uh, there is a tradition in the Basel, it's the, it's the festival, the carnival, and uh, he decided to launch it in a very, very uh, typical way, the local way. So it was authentic, it was simple, and uh, it, was, uh, it was just, uh, I mean, different. And, I mean, I told you that I am quite uh, recent in the brand, a little bit more than six years, and all the journalists that I met uh, that were present at that time, they all remember this event. I mean, it's, it's one of the events since uh, so many years that they, they keep in their mind because it was authentic, and they, they have been just shocked, surprised, uh, in a positive way, if I may say, that what, that what has been presented to them because it was just uh, a kind of UFO a kind of revolution uh, that they have had the opportunity to see. Two quotes from Mr. Rolf Schneider that, in, in my opinion, uh, underline quite well the mindset of the company at that time, and I, I hope that we are able today to, to preserve this, uh, uh, this vision, as the company Elis Nardin has never shied away from a challenge. And Ulysse Nardin's legitimate watches are the antithesis of market-driven product. We are going to come back on that. We are a manufacturer before being a brand, in fact. Uh, and uh, and uh, we are always being driven by technical innovation. It's really what is at the heart of the, of the cultural mindset at Ulysse Nardin. Quotes from the press, the freak changed the face of contemporary watchmaking. A super watch, unlike anything anyone has seen before, mechanically sophisticated, visually arresting, and apologically exotic. The freak uh, has been uh, the, considered by the brand as the laboratory on the wrist. It was a laboratory on the wrist because it's, it works like a window, obviously. I mean, you see the movement, there is no dial, uh, so everything is transparent, everything is open. Uh, and uh, we have always introduced our new technologies, our invention inside the free collection during the last 20 years. For example, by presenting some concept watches. Uh, you have on the left Innovision 1, in the center Innovision 2. Uh, in the, on the right uh, part of the screen, the freak next. Uh, 20 inventions uh, in the two Innovision, an incredible uh, concept for the freak next, with a uh, flying oscillator made of uh, 32 plates in silicium, uh, built in four layers with no axis in the middle. Uh, and, and I mean, around half of the innovations that have been presented inside those concept watches have been then uh, fueling the freak collection and then uh, the vast majority of them we have used them for the manufacture caliber that we are producing and proposing in the rest of our collection. I'm going to cover two fields, uh, the silicium technologies and also the blade technologies, which are, let's say, representing the vast majority of the innovations that have been ca carried by the freak during these uh, 20 years. So, we discussed about uh, Cigatec. Cigatec is based in the Swiss Valley, in the middle of the mountains. It is a, it's a high-tech company, uh, which is uh, producing uh, silicium components for the watchmaking industry, and not only, but mainly the watchmaking industry. Uh, the silicium technology, uh, originally, is used for electronics, 
uh, as you can see on the screen, uh, it requires uh, a, a specific infrastructure in order to be uh, produced in a clean uh, manner, uh, what we call the salle blanche, so it's a, it's a white room. Uh, you have here on the screen all the different components that Cigatech has produced for a listener. They are also producing for some other brands, obviously. Uh, but I have chosen this photo because all of the components that you see here are in silicium and have been designed and produced, I mean designed by listener and produced by Cigatech for us. Uh, and I invite you to, to do a one minute break with a short video uh, introducing Cigatech. suppliers from Cigatech, they produce large cylinders uh, and they cut the, the cylinders with a wire uh, and the disc that you see here on the screen is called a wafer and Cigatech is producing the components uh, from the wafer. So ju just to give you, let's say, a very, very uh, summarized background about what is, what is before the different step of production for silicium components for watchmaking. So if you enter a little bit more in the process of producing silicium components, you have the first step which is called the photoresist. Um, it's a kind of, uh, I'm, I'm maybe not going to use the right word, but it's a kind of, uh, let's say, epoxy, but it's a mask that you put on the top of the, of the wafer and through uh, the exposure to ultraviolet uh, uh, light, uh, you are going to, uh, to do a photo uh, lithography that will uh, design, if I may say, uh, the, uh, the, the components to be cutted uh, through another step that is uh, done with plasma etching. This step is called uh, dry, deep reactive ion etching. And the principle here is that you are going to, uh, to, to remove um, around each component in a very, very precise way. So we are very, very close to the, I mean, we are, we are at, the, at the micron level, of course, uh, and in a perfect manner because the, the, the wafer is, uh, is made of mono, monocrystalline material. So it, you, you are going to, uh, to have a component that will be absolutely perfect and precise in terms of cutting. Yeah. So you are going to uh, prepare the, the wafer uh, with the 
all the components inside and cut them one by one with, uh, let's say, the, the plasma etching. Then there is a step that is called thermal oxidation, uh, which is uh, necessary to reinforce the durability of the material. And also that allows thermal composition, particularly for the air springs. You see here on different uh, steps, huh? uh, so you have the material, you have the wafer, uh, and then with the deep reactive ion etching, you, you are going to be able to, uh, to cut each uh, component. We have a last step in the treatment uh, that we may use depending on uh, what we choose as a, as, a, as a brand, which is the diamond C treatment. It's a patented treatment uh, invented uh, at Ulysse Sardin. It is, uh, it is a treatment where, I mean, uh, we use the wafer, we, uh, we put it at, uh, with a process of uh, um, uh, uh, a kind of uh, oven at more than 2,000 degrees uh, Celsius, and uh, we, uh, we create uh, uh, carbon uh, from carbon uh, base, uh, we uh, create uh, synthetic uh, diamond uh, um, surfacing that will cover, that will come on top of the silicium. So you will have a five micron uh, um, cover surface uh, that will uh, even reinforce again the durability uh, of the uh, silicium. And this is a specific treatment that has been developed between uh, Cigatec and Ulysse oh, In few words, what are the technical benefits uh, and the customer benefits for the silicium? I mean, it's a monocrystalline material, it's light, it's elastic, it allows complex shapes, uh, it's lubrication free, uh, it increases the durability, uh, it's non-magnetic, and it's uh, thermal compositive. So as you can see, I mean, it, it's a real breakthrough, and I believe that in the watchmaking industry, it's an industry that has centuries of history, and uh, we are perpetuating a lot of uh, know-hows, it's, uh, it's what makes the beauty of this uh, industry. It's very difficult to reach uh, the level of uh, bringing a breakthrough. And uh, this, uh, this has been done through this uh, technology. Uh, and Ulysse Nardin has been part of it during all these years that were uh, preceding uh, the year 2001, which was the presentation of the very first freak. The competition was fierce between all the players who were searching in this field. The Rolex, the Patek Philippe, the Swatch Group, and uh, a, very, a very small brand, independent, Ulysse Nardin. Fought against these big groups, or big brands, and we finished uh, at the finish line, we arrived first with the Freak. 2001, first silicium escapement, uh, the encore, the escapement wheel in silicium for the very first time. And then the story has been continuing with different generations of freak. We are going to come back on that. Uh, the diamond seed treatment, patented by Ulysse Nardin in 2007, we spoke about it. Uh, you see here the, the diamond coating on top of the silicium. The first silicium air spring to be presented in the market in 2009 into a freak. Uh, silicium balance wheel 2017, as far as I know, we are the second brand to do that uh, after Patek Philippe. So, I mean, the silicium is clearly uh, linked and the history of the conquest of this technology is very linked to the, the freak. We are going to come back on that, but not from the perspective of the material, but from the perspective of the product itself. Second uh, field of innovation, flexible blades. Uh, you have here, for example, uh, the flying encore, 
that has been introduced in 2015, that was the GPSG price. Uh, and the principle of this plane encore is that you have, uh, you have no axis. Uh, so, uh, of course, it's allow, it allows to avoid friction. Uh, the piece that you see here is made of uh, silicium. So you can combine the use of the silicium technology to the principle of the blades. And the idea here is that, uh, uh, of course, uh, this is allowed by the fact that you can do build very complex shape uh, with the, the silicium process. And you, you see the shape of this component, it's quite uh, impressive. The grinder, so this is not related to the silicium uh, technology as a material, but it is uh, using the principle of flexibles and blades. Uh, the principle of the grinder is that it is, a, it is an automatic winding system that has been patented in 2017 and introduced for the free collection. Uh, the grinder uh, is uh, answering, if I may say, is giving a response to any micro movement of the wrist. So the principle is that it's, the, the, the winding is twice more efficient than the traditional skating weight. Uh, it's, it's, it's working through, uh, let's say, a, a, a translation. It's a system that, as it is uh, in translation, there is no... Uh, you have four levers instead of two. And uh, there, as a result, there is no, uh, there is no yield effect. Uh, it's always working. And uh, uh, so this is bringing efficiency to the, uh, the automatic winding uh, of the timepiece. And you will see that uh, this patent has been very useful very recently inside the free collection. We are going to come back on that. I mentioned also the Freak Next uh, with a patented flying oscillator that has been presented in 2019. It's an uh, impressive uh, 12 Hz uh, oscillator, and uh, we believe, I mean, it's, the system is offering a power reserve of 70 hours. We believe that. It is a new step that could uh, open some doors for the future, and we are going to continue to work on it. The principle of innovation, uh, as you can imagine, is that from time to time, you innovate in a direction without understanding entirely where, you are, where it will bring you, in fact. And something that has been done five years ago, 10 years ago, uh, finds uh, is a uh, utility uh, later on and the principle is always to try to push the limits and, uh, and, and to do this effort of reinventing yourself. So a, a quick summary of the Freak Legacy uh, through the product uh, standpoint now. So the first product has been launched in 2001. I would say it was not a real uh, flying carousel because uh, it was done with the means of the of the of this period of time. You know, in the watchmaking industry, it was it was not like today. Uh, you had a vertical axis that was uh, supporting uh, uh, all the caliber and that was uh, touching the, the sapphire glass. Uh, so it was it was it was looking more. Uh, it was more a prototype, let's say, if I may say, a concept watch than, uh, than, uh, than a real watch. It was not what proof. Uh, the, uh, the bezel was turning on itself, obviously, because you set the time of the bezel, but some people were losing uh, the time because it was, it was unlocked. And then we have improved uh, the product. 2005, by the addition of a locker, the product is becoming waterproof. Uh, it's becoming a real uh, flying carousel. Uh, so it's, we are starting here to, uh, let's say, to improve the, 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 the product. We are also starting to enrich the product with uh, new technologies. During uh, all that, those years, we are trying new escapements, escapements in diamond, I mean synthetic diamond, but full diamond, uh, air spring in diamond, uh, of course, industrially-wise, it's uh, too costly, it's too difficult, so this is why we have developed the diamond seed treatment. Uh, 
But uh, still, we are searching, we are presenting concept watches like Innovision One. 2013, we bring uh, the Cruiser, which is uh, one of the, the main, uh, the most well-known calibers that you can find into uh, the fruit collection, a flying carousel, a centered tourbillon, the Freak Lab, uh, the Freak Phantom, the Freak Diavolo, uh, flying carousel carrying uh, an orbital, uh, I mean orbital, a flying tourbillon. So, the level of complexity is rising, and uh, of course, all these products are uh, carrying the silicium technology. Then, uh, the apparition of new materials like uh, titanium, uh, the apparition of the blade uh, technologies, the material is becoming automatic because the industry is evolving and uh, the manual winding is considered as, let's say, too traditional. So we, uh, we patent and invent the grinder with the Freak Vision in 2018, uh, the Freak presentation of the Freak Next in 2019, the launch of the Freak X, which uh, is a kind of disruption inside the Freak collection because we are bringing to the market a product that is uh, positioned around 30,000 US dollars for a flying carousel. Uh, we still uh, keep the silicium technologies that you can find uh, for the escapement. For the air spring, we uh, discover some new materials, composite materials, for example, silicium marquetry for uh, movement decoration. 2022, the launch of the Freak S, we are going to come back on that. A double oscillator that is uh, uh, composited by a vertical differential system. So, uh, supercharge, proposal, let's say. 2023, we are going to continue uh, and we are going to bring in the market again a new freak. And uh, we believe that this collection is really at the heart of uh, our manufacturing know-how and I will come back on that a little bit more in detail. I believe that the two concepts of uh, in the freak and uh, independent integrated manufacture are really uh, intertwined. All what has been done inside the free collection has allowed the Nardin to grow and establish itself as an independent integrated manufacturer. This uh, related to, of course, the skills, the knows of the people inside the company, the use of the new materials for escapements, uh, and this uh, mindset that is uh, absolutely necessary if you want to reach this level of uh, uh, integration. You have here in front of you the 118, which is our flagship caliber. It's the caliber that you will find in a marine tortiller, in other words, in the, uh, our enterprise uh, uh, product proposal at Ulysse Nardin. Uh, it's, a, it's a chronometer, it's basically the, the wristwatch transcription of a deck chronometer. Uh, the navigation instrument. And this caliber has been manufactured in-house. It is equipped uh, with uh, silicium escapement, silicium air spring, diamond seal treatment, and uh, it is uh, positioned uh, below 10,000 uh, US dollars. And it has been uh, created with the use of the, all the technologies that we have developed through our laboratory on the wrist, the Freak. Another way to see it is maybe to give you some uh, metrics just for, for you to understand a little bit what is the influence of the freak on this process of establishing Willis Nardin as a manufacturer. Uh, we are producing a little bit less than 10,000 watches per year. So again, it shows also, let's say, the, the, the size of the company. I mean, uh, we are a small company. And of course, in my opinion, uh, this, is, uh, uh, this is again uh, showing the level of commitment and courage that has been necessary uh, for all these people to develop such type of technologies inside the freak. 90% of our production is made of manufactured calibers, and 100% of these calibers are equipped with uh, silicium components. 
In uh, the last 25 years, we have developed uh, 38 watch movements. So, and I am here since, as I said, since uh, six years, I have never seen one year without presenting a new caliber at Ulysses Nardin. And again, if you relate this level uh, uh, of creativity and innovation to the size of the company, you see maybe that uh, 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 you understand maybe uh, more the, 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 the mindset uh, of the brand, which is really uh, technically oriented. 15% of our production is made of uh, tourbillon and carousel watches, so it's a, high, a certain level in terms of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, technical content and uh, inner value. And a large part, of course, of this 15% uh, is uh, made by the Freak uh, collection. Today, on a worldwide basis, uh, you have uh, a club of 5,000 uh, people owning a Freak product. So it's still a very limited and a very uh, niche uh, uh, brand, uh, sorry, uh, product, concept. And it is something that is uh, uh, speaking a lot to uh, collectors and people who like uh, to wear something that is uh, not only uh, uh, a very particular timepiece, if I may say, but also uh, a concept watch in a certain manner. Another way to put it into perspective is to, to, to draw a map of the, of the industry. Of course, this, uh, I mean, this mapping is from me, it's uh, personal, it's my, my personal interpretation. And uh, I, I admit that you, uh, you can see the things in a different perspective. It's very difficult to find the right definition. The, I mean, it reminds me, you know, I have asked, uh, Carol Forestier and Ludwig Oeschlin, both of them. I told them, uh, do you believe that the freak is a carousel or a tourbillon? Because I have this question from some clients. And both of them, they told me, this is, this is uh, not a relevant question, it's a fake debate. And I liked that answer. And uh, uh, it's a little bit the same for the notion of, uh, I mean, manufacture, you can have uh, your own opinion depending on your angle of, of, of perspective. But in the meantime, I think some, some elements should be, uh, let's say, some facts should be underlined. Uh, so I have chosen 27 competitors. I've, I could have select more. The market is quite uh, diversified. But if you take only the independence, and the brands that have a certain level of integration, meaning by that they produce their own calibers, or most of them, uh, at the end I have noticed 13. But when I say, and it's, I, I choose this picture because I, it summarizes quite well what I believe is a manufacturer. For me, a manufacturer, and I invite you to visit Ulysse Nardin, of course, but it's uh, people who are developing their own calibers, but they have also I mean, a certain level of uh, uh, capacities in terms of uh, innovation, development, uh, quality control, uh, machineries, etc. Eight of them are highly integrated. And again, you can, I mean, we can discuss, so we, can, uh, we can argue, but it's just to give you a rough idea, at least it's my own Modestly, my own personal view, I believe that Uli Stardin is part of them. Uh, and four of them own the silicon technology for escapement and, uh, sorry, for uh, air springs, yes. So this shows, uh, let's say, uh, uh, how uh, the Freak collection has been important for us uh, in uh, reaching in uh, 25 years, the, the status of manufacture again. So what is, what is the free collection in 2022? Today, you have three products inside the collection. You have the Freak X, you have the Freak Vision, and you have the Freak S. And of course, the more you go up inside this collection, that is starting at 30K, and uh, finishing at 130K, 
thousand US dollar price positioning, the more it is equipped with a uh, uh, level of uh, uh, integrated uh, technical content. Uh, 